Hi you guys, I made the rookie YouTuber mistake of forgetting to film an intro to my video and I just discovered Bailey Sarian's channel. I'm sure if you're even watching my video you know who she is. She did this little mint situation makeup look while talking about the heartbreaking case of Natalie Holloway. Please subscribe if you haven't already and let's get into the video. Natalie Holloway was an 18 year old girl First of all, she was absolutely gorgeous. She was stunning. She grew up in Mountain Brook, Alabama, and she was the first of two children. Natalie actually was born, I believe, in Memphis, Tennessee. Her parents got divorced at a fairly young age, and her mom got remarried, and that is when they were relocated to Alabama. So Natalie was a senior at Mountain Brook High School, and there was a school trip that was being planned for the seniors for graduation. This was to take place in Aruba in the Caribbean. So the school trip would be Natalie as well as 124 other students from the school and there would be seven chaperones. Also, I'm totally not trying to be <laughs> super judgy over here but i feel like a graduation trip for 124 the 18 year old students i feel like aruba probably isn't where i would choose for them that just sounds like a terrible idea written all over it but that's just me gerald dompick who was an investigator for this case basically said what you're probably all thinking like all of these students literally partied and drank this whole entire trip and like i don't know what these chaperones were doing but you know a lot of the students did come forward and say yeah that's that's basically all we did this entire trip now the morning of may 30th of 2005 is when natalie was supposed to be getting on her flight back home from this trip this is kind of when worry started arising is when she did not show up for her flight that day and again how did they make it all the way to the airport, all the way through anything without anybody noticing that she wasn't there? So immediately following the missed flight, Natalie's family flew down and immediately started looking for her. The Arubian police were involved and you know this was this was acted upon very quickly and treated like a missing persons case very quickly. At this point, other students and friends of Natalie said that she was last seen at the Carlos and Charlie's nightclub and diner. And she was last seen at this location at 1.30 to 2 o'clock in the morning. So this is where investigators and Natalie's parents first went. Here, the owner of the club was able to pull the security footage for that night. This is where they saw Natalie leaving with these three boys, essentially. I'm going to call them boys. They're boys. Now, one of these boys, the owner of the nightclub actually recognized and was able to give investigators his name. And his name is Jordan Vandersloot. Jordan Vandersloot was a 17 year old Dutch student who was going to school at this like international school of Aruba. At this time, the police and Natalie's parents all go to the residence of this Jordan Vandersloot fellow. At first, Jordan basically denies knowing who Natalie even was. Like, I have no idea who she is, never seen her in my life. His story quickly changed. He then started saying, oh yeah, her, okay. Yeah, we were with her. And then he goes on to tell his story or account of what happened. Now, I kind of keep forgetting to mention that the other two that were Jordan's friends that were in the car and kind of with them the whole night were brothers and that were roommates of his and basically just his friends. Once they spent some time over at this California beach area, the boys said that they had dropped Natalie off at her hotel at around two in the morning. And when they dropped her off, they said that she was obviously extremely intoxicated. She was stumbling getting out of the car and when Jordan asked if she needed help she refused his help and said I'm good like you're good to 
leave. And as the boys were driving away, they said that they had seen a man approach her who looked like a security guard from the hotel. And because they saw this man and he looked like a security guard, they assumed she would be fine and she was in good hands. So at this point, there were search and rescue teams, you know, deployed and there were hundreds of people volunteering to help search for Natalie. On June 5th, Aruban police detained two men. This was a man named Nick Johnson and a man named Abraham Jones who were previously security guards at the hotel that is right across the street from the Holiday Inn that Natalie was staying at. These boys kind of had had a history with the police like they were this type of bodyguards that were always trying to kind of get with the girls who were staying in the hotel that they worked at they were kind of creepy it's also worth noting that at the time you know they questioned Jordan and his friends and didn't really have any reason not to believe them right so when they said we dropped her off and the security guy came and it seemed like everything was fine at that time like nobody really question that they didn't have a reason to shortly after the security guards were detained Jordan and his friends were detained as well it hasn't been like released but it's my assumption that this is kind of when they maybe were thinking that the boys were lying because they talked to the security guards maybe they had alibis I don't know shortly after they were detained is when they went back to Jordan and his friends and were like okay what really happened. During the questioning, one of the investigators came forward and said, one of the boys said something had happened to Natalie when they took her, you know, to the beach that night. Next morning, a woman who was kind of a spokesperson for the investigation said that she could not confirm that that was said. Now we are at June 26 in the investigation and all of the sudden, out of nowhere, all three of these boys decide to change their stories. Basically, all these boys were kind of trying to pin it on Jordan. They were like, he's the one. You know, after we had went to the beach, Jordan actually decided that he was going to take Natalie back to a different hotel. And these boys were also kind of saying, like, it seemed like Natalie was really into Jordan. Like, we didn't think anything. You know if they wanted to go back to a hotel together like who were we to stop them now this specific hotel is the Marriott Hotel that's not too far from the Holiday Inn now something very important to know is that obviously you know the hotel lobby cameras were looked at fairly early on in the investigation and Natalie was never seen in the lobby at all it was at this time that a gardener who worked in the Marriott Hotel said that he saw Jordan digging around by this pond area like I guess there's some kind of pond situation by this Marriott Hotel. The gardener also mentioned that when he saw Jordan leaving he looked as if he was in some kind of distress. He also looked like he was trying to cover up his face. He said that he kind of had his arm like in front of his face and like was leaving in a hurry. At this point, investigators drained that entire pond and they found nothing. It was a complete dead end. As more kind of news started coming out about Natalie, they started getting some more tips. Again, the gardener at the hotel being one of them. There also was somebody who was jogging who said that he saw boys fitting the description of all three of Jordan and his friends carrying something in this like landfill area. Once again, investigators started looking into this area and they brought tracking dogs. They were digging up this whole area of this landfill and nothing was found. You know, that's what's really frustrating is they were getting a lot of tips coming in. They were getting some people coming forward thinking that they saw something and everything was just leading them to dead ends. At this point, Natalie's parents were offering over a million dollars to anybody who could come forward with information that would lead to her remains, that would lead to her hopefully. Now this is when something extremely interesting happens in this case. On May 30th of 2010, which is five years to the day of Natalie's disappearance, 21 year old business student Stephanie Ramirez is reported missing from her hotel in Lima, Peru. She was found dead three days later in a room 
under the name of guess who? Jordan Vandersloot. And here's kind of the part that's crazy to me. Obviously Jordan was arrested for this. He actually admitted to killing Stephanie pretty quickly. And he basically said that he had lost his temper when he came into the room and found Stephanie looking through his laptop. What she found on his laptop was apparently some kind of evidence leading him to the disappearance of Natalie. At this point, police are saying that Stephanie started getting extremely scared and nervous and started kind of trying to leave, you know, and this is when Jordan lost his temper. So this is where I'm kind of confused. I've looked so many places because I just feel like this is kind of conflicting information where if Stephanie had found some kind of evidence or something to lead her to believe that he had anything to do with Natalie's disappearance on Jordan's laptop, I don't know anything about technology, you guys. I feel like the police would have been able to find the same, if not similar evidence to what Stephanie was talking about. I'm not sure if, you know, he wiped his computer of that stuff after he had just committed this crime. I don't know, but I'm really curious as to what this evidence was because it sounded like it was potentially could have been something to tie him to Natalie's murder. So obviously at this time, Jordan was sentenced to prison for the murder of Stephanie. In 2011, Natalie's dad filed a petition to the Alabama state to have his daughter declared legally dead. And on January 12, 2012, the judge did sign this and declared Natalie legally deceased. I did see some information that Natalie's mom kind of wasn't really wanting this. I I think I think she still has hope. I think she still, you know, thought that Natalie was out there and, and she still, you know, could be. In 2016, Natalie's father decided to hire a private investigator to kind of reopen this case, look at all the evidence, and basically go through this with a fine tooth comb to see if there's anything anybody could have missed. During this investigation is when the private investigator comes by a boy named Gabriel, or I guess a man, whatever. Now, Gabriel was very good friends with Jordan and like his two friends, right? Like he was kind of in the same crowd as him. Gabriel claimed that a friend of theirs named John Ludwig actually told Gabriel that he had helped Jordan dig up Natalie's bones, crush them, and essentially cremate them a couple of years after this whole situation took place. Now again, there's no like evidence or proof of this happening. And Jordan obviously went to prison for Stephanie's murder. So here we are you guys 15 years later and there's still really like no justice for Natalie. If you ask me, I think that Jordan dude absolutely had something to do with this. And I feel like somebody like him is extremely shady. He is the last person to be seen with her and it just bums me out so much that there is no like hard evidence on him because while I'm so extremely happy that he is put away in prison for another murder, I just don't think it's fair that Natalie's family still isn't getting the justice that they deserve. And I just wish somehow Jordan could be officially tied and trialed because I absolutely think that he had something to do with Natalie's murder. Like there's no doubt in my mind. Leave a comment down below and tell me if you think it was Jordan, yes or no. And if you don't, that's fine. Who do you think it was? Think if you think it was Jordan, if you don't, let me know. If you guys haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and like this video. Thanks for watching.